Thank you. Um, every night this week, and I know that I can't possibly expect that anyone would come every night, but I would hope that there would be some other times in which you're able to get here. Uh, also, I know that whatever we're doing tonight will be available. So there will be, in general, I'm going to try to make sure what I do is a standalone, but at the same time, it would be enhanced if you were able to hear some of the other talks we're going to give the rest of the week. Just trying to get you out. Uh, each night this week, we're going to be looking at a, uh, a topic, or a thing, that you can't live without. No matter who you are, no matter what your belief system, no matter who you are, you've got to have these things, these five things we're going to be looking at this week. Uh, and you have to have a working theory of how you get it. So, for example, you have to have satisfaction in life that's strong enough to handle the, the up and down of changing circumstances. You've got to have a sense of worth and self, a sense of worth and self that's stable enough to handle the ups and downs of your own performance. You've got to have an ability to face trouble and suffering and difficulty uh, in such a way that you don't just survive it, but that you actually grow through it. Uh, you need a hope that helps you face the future or even death. You can't live without these things, and everybody in this room has to be seeking them, and you're looking, you have to have a working theory for how to get them. And tonight, and every night <laughs> this week, I'm here to try as much as I can to be respectful to all the various views on how you get these things, but I'm here to be a, uh, to make a case for why Christianity has arguably, and you can argue, but having said that, arguably unequaled resources to give you these things. Now tonight the thing we're going to look at is this. You can't change the world and you can't change yourself unless you have a working theory of what's wrong with us, what's wrong with the world, what's wrong with human beings. So if you would go to a doctor and say, I have a fever and a rash, please treat me for a fever and a rash, the doctor is going to say, I can't treat you for the fever and the rash. She's going to say, unless I know what's causing the fever and the rash. So there's, she's going to have to do a diagnosis of some kind. I talk to people all the time who say, I want to bring more justice in the world. But the question immediately comes up, well, what, why isn't there justice? Where's the injustice come from? And most people I talk to have no idea. Well, then how are you going to deal with the injustice? It's like a, it's a fever and a rash. You have to understand something about where it comes from. So you're not going to be able to, to uh, change yourself or change the world unless you have a working theory of what's wrong with the human race what's wrong with us. And what we're going to do is we're going to look each night at a particular text in the book of Mark, which is all over the place around here. And uh, each night I'm going to try to show you, uh, not only reflect on the issues around the subject, but I'm going to show you how this text sh uh, gives us the Christian resource for that particular thing. I'm going to read chapter 7. Uh, you could follow along if you wish, though it doesn't look like it's extremely uh, bright out there and the prince small, but here's what Mark chapter 7, verses 14 through 23 will give us. And there's some real resources in here. Now Jesus is starting in the middle of a conversation, so we'll explain where, uh, who he's speaking to, but he, starting in verse 14. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them, Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Now let's ask four questions and see what the Christian resources are. Let's ask the question, um, is there something wrong with us? 
Where is there something wrong with us? What is the thing that is wrong with us? And what to do about it? Is there something wrong with us? Where is it? What is it? What to do about it? Now Jesus is, you can see we come into the middle of a conversation. He starts off with a lecture. And then, by the way, this reminds me of Oxford here. Notice he, goes, he then has a little tutorial with his disciples afterwards. Notice how the, t- the tutorial starts. The tutor says, are you so dull? So, <laughs> just trying to contextualize t- to my setting. Um, Jesus is at a controversy because he and his disciples do not follow all the clean laws. The clean laws of the time were enhanced mosaic regulations, and the, uh, the religious leaders of the day said you may not go into worship, you are unfit for worship, unless you, uh, there's many foods that were considered unclean, you can't eat those foods, you can't eat in a certain way, you have to wash your hands in a certain way, and there was a very elaborate set of regulations to help people who felt they were unfit for the presence of God, to feel that they had worked at being morally and spiritually cleansed. Jesus does, and his disciples did not follow all those laws, and we'll explain why in a minute. But the, we need to start by asking the question, why are we even talking about this? This is modernity. This is Oxford. This is one of the hearts of modernity. Uh, why in the world would such an arcane, uh, religious, ancient religious uh, uh, conflict have any uh, relevance to us today? If you said that, with respect, you'd be wrong. Because modern people have just as much of a problem with feelings of shame, with feelings that they're not what they ought to be, that they are stained somehow. And what's remarkable is, it wasn't remarkable that ancient people felt that way. What's remarkable is that we still are struggling with this. There's a number of scholars recently have been commenting on this over the last 10 years or so, if you'd like a real summary of it, uh, you can find this online. Look for a, an article, The Strange Persistence of Guilt, by Wilfred MacLay. The Strange Persistence of Guilt. But here's the point. Uh, when Nietzsche wrote The Genealogy of Morality, he was quite excited because he said, obviously when you wrong an individual person, you should feel guilty. But, he says, the sense that we are sinners, the sense that we are uh, bad, the sense that we are unworthy. He says that didn't come in, that's a problem we have now, and that didn't come in until God, the, the concept of God came in. And he says, he was very excited because he says we're reversing direction. Uh, the, our, our world is becoming less and less religious, and he actually said when we get rid of the idea of God, then that sense of unworthiness and shame and guilt will go away, and he actually said, quote unquote, it will be humankind's second innocence. We'll get back to the way we were before this awful idea of God came in. Now, the fact, of course, is that Nietzsche was right that the world, since Nietzsche's time, the world's become a lot less uh, religious. Certainly, Europe has. And on top of that, we have a, a, a culture marked by what some, someone has called the triumph of the therapeutic, where everyone should feel free to invent him or herself, where uh, no one should make you feel guilty about anything, and yet, it's still a huge problem. What Nietzsche said it was happening, the cause is there, which is less and less religious. The cause is there, but the effect is not there. We are not any less struggling with guilt and shame. Uh, Robert J. Lifton, who was a very prominent American psychiatrist, uh, he was a, a pioneer in brain research, has a fascinating statement. He also was not at all a religious man. But he's a fascinating place where he says this, He says, even though modern people do not feel, quote, the the constraints of traditional religion, they don't even feel the the constraints of family uh, responsibility as they did in the past, they feel free to invent themselves, yet, he says, they still suffer from guilt. They suffer from it considerably, without awareness of what they are suffering. There is a persistent kind of self-condemnation, but now without religious categories to name it. Rather than a clear feeling of evil or sinfulness, he writes, it takes the form of a nagging sense of unworthiness all the more troublesome for its lack of clear origin. And uh, Freud's book, 
uh, civilization and its discontents. Uh, famous book, but it's about guilt. And notice he calls guilt what he calls he calls guilt discontent. Uh, he uses the German word there for guilt, unbehagen, which means a malaise, a disease, almost maybe a, a nausea. And what he says there is guilt hides itself. One of Freud's commentators, uh, trying to uh, summarize what Freud said, uh, says this. Guilt is crafty. Guilt is a trickster, a chameleon. It changes size and appearance. It disguises itself as anger, boredom, or a sense that nothing tastes. Why isn't life better, we say? Why don't I fit in? Why is everything out of whack? That's guilt. Even though, bottom line, first point, even though... <laughs> We have come to explain guilt away. It's a, it's a form of social control, Freud said. It's evolutionary biology, other people say. We've explained it away. We say you need to be free from it. We don't believe, maybe, in God or heaven or hell or the word sin. Yet there's still a voice. You know it. That calls you a fool. That comes at you and says you're not what you ought to be. You work and work and work and work and work to prove yourself to, well, we're not exactly sure who. And it's never enough? No, no, we got a problem. We got a problem with shame, with guilt. We feel stained. We know there's something wrong with us. And now, we don't have religious categories to discuss it, and we don't have any good explanation of origin, which makes it all the more devastating. So is there something wrong with us? Yes. Number two, where is that something coming from? When Jesus talks about, he says, listen, it's... it's Nothing outside a person defiles them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them, what comes out of the heart. Jesus, of course, is wading into uh, one of the great debates in history. Uh, one of the uh, classic examples of the debate uh, was between Hobbes and Rousseau. And, of course, the question is, are human beings basically bad and selfish? And society, we need society to kind of keep it in check. Or... Are human beings basically good and we need society to ruin us? <laughs> is it we're basically good and society ruins us or are we basically bad and society kind of constrains us? Which is it? Now, the, even though that's, uh, it, that debate's been going on for a long time, the fact of the matter is that Rousseau has won in modern culture. Hands down has won. Because uh, as we'll look at Wednesday night, a little encouragement, what we're going to be doing Wednesday night is looking at this, but at the heart of our culture is the idea that you have to be true to yourself. And the way you're true to yourself is you look on the inside, you don't let anybody from outside define who you are. You look inside and you define your deepest desires, aspirations, and dreams, and that's part of the way in which you find your truth and you find who you are. That assumes Rousseau. It assumes that in the end what defiles you is from outside. Social conditions, psychological conditions, biological... Things from the outside might come in and ruin us, but in ourselves, we're fine. And therefore, anything you do wrong is really the result of something from the outside. Clarence Darrow, who, uh, if you know your U.S. history, you would know that he, uh, not that you should, uh, not, I don't know implication there, but he was, the, he was the, uh, a lawyer that went up against William Jennings Bryan uh, in the very famous Scopes trial, the Monkey Trial over a man who was teaching evolution in class and a state in which it was illegal many years ago. And Darrow, of course, was, uh, uh, he was the, uh, he supported, of course, the teaching of evolution. And he has a very famous speech that he made in 1902, which gets across the Rousseauian idea. And here's what he says. He says, there is no such thing as a crime in the way the world is generally understood. People are not in jail because they deserve to be. They are in jail simply because they cannot avoid it. Through an accident of circumstances which are entirely beyond their control and from which they are in no way responsible. If you've committed a crime, it's because of, it's because of psychological, sociological factors, systems that have come upon you and put you in that position. That's why he says there is no such thing as a crime in the way the, world is, the word is generally understood. So absolutely, the Rousseau approach is what has won. But, question, is that right? Now, Jesus says it's what comes out that defiles us. Jesus clearly votes on the side that says, yes, there are social systems that can aggravate evil, but where did the, where did the evil come from? 
I mean, where did the evil come from in the social system? It came from inside. Now, the Bible, by the way, is not so uh, simplistic as to say human beings are terribly evil. They're just scum. The Bible says that we are made in the image of God and we also are fallen and therefore we're a kind of explosive mixture of good and evil. But Jesus says, when it comes to the main direction, the evil in the world is coming from us. Do you believe it? I mean, that's going against everything in your culture, pretty much everything you're being taught, or at least uh, what, what is assumed. If you don't, let me give you an argument on Jesus' behalf that I would call the argument from Auschwitz. I can do this pretty briefly. My wife and I got to Auschwitz for the very first time this year, uh, actually last year, and it was the first time. And of course, those of you who have been there, or even it's still familiar enough that you know what I'm talking about here. The breadth of the evil was astounding. Uh, how many people were killed so quickly. The depth of the evil, uh, the emphasis on science and technology to just get more efficient so every day we could just kill a few more, just to be a little more efficient in the furnaces, a little more efficient with how people did this or that. It reminds you of what Jürgen Habermas said, that science can tell you how to do something efficiently, but it can never tell you whether you ought to do it or not. You're going to have to look somewhere else besides science to figure that out. But here's the question. Why were those people capable of that kind of evil? Why? I think there's pretty much three answers. One answer is Clarence Darrow. There's no such thing as a crime. Anything you do wrong is because you, a social system or psychological uh, 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 you know, uh, factors led you to do it, and therefore the Nazis were not guilty, they were just simply, they were victims themselves of some kind of social system. Uh, in other words, it really wasn't their fault. They were just victims. And of course, if you do that, you trivialize what happened. And you have no longer any categories to even talk about the depth of evil that you saw there. So to say, well, it wasn't Nazis' fault, it was just uh, social systems, that, that, that's a uh, you know, that trivialized evil. The second thing you can say is bec they were, because they themselves were terrible people. I could not do that. You could never do that. Most people would not be capable of that. Only certain kinds of really terrible people could do that. They did it. They're like second-class human beings. They're subhuman. Whoops, wait a minute. Hey, that's what they did. That's what they said about the Jews. That's how they dehumanized them so they were able to justify doing what they did to them. So, number one... If you don't want to trivialize what happened at Auschwitz, number two, if you don't want to make yourself capable of doing it yourself, number three, you need to say that every human being is capable of horrendous evil. There's something really wrong within us. It's out of the heart. So you see, the, uh, the world says, you're fine inside. It's the world out here. Your, our problems come from outside, and you inside have all that you need to make things right. The Bible says it's exactly the opposite. The problems come from inside, and you don't have the resources to make it right. The resources are way outside you, way outside you, in heaven, actually. Number three, okay, if that's where it is and where it's coming from, what is it? And here, again, uh, just to not try to get you to come back, uh, we'll talk about this again actually tomorrow night. But when Jesus says in his little list, and it's a really important list, out of the heart comes sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. We don't have time to drill down very much, but notice making money is okay, but greed, having confidence is okay, but pride. The background of this list is one of the main words used in the Bible for sin. It's a word, ava, which actually means something that's dislocated, out of place. It's a word that's used to mean a dislocated bone. When a bone is not in its proper socket, it's twisted out of its shape, and it's very painful. And what the Bible says is, and Jesus actually says this here, sin is a dislocated heart. To explain that, I just turn briefly to Augustine, who is the premier theologian of this part of, of Christian theology. What he would say is, and his most famous line is, our hearts are restless. We were made for God, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in him. That means that your heart, our hearts, are dislocated bones. 
They're supposed to be resting in the socket of God. They're supposed to be loving God more than anything else and resting in God for meaning and, uh, and for, uh, for hope and for significance more than anything else. And to the degree that you love anything more than God, to that degree your life is disordered. Your loves are disordered. You're loving some things that are worthy to be loved, but you're loving God too little in relationship to them. And because your loves are out of order, all sin is basically disordered love. Try that on for a second. All sin is disordered love. So for, what is courage? It's loving your neighbor's safety more than your own. What is cowardice? It's loving your own safety more than theirs. Your loves are out of order. What is injustice? Injustice is loving your own power more than the rights of other people. What is, you know, what, that's, I mean, pardon me, what is injustice? Loving the rights, uh, lo- loving your own power more than the rights of other people. What is justice? It's putting the, the, the needs and rights of other people, loving them actually more than you're loving your own power and your self-interest. But ultimately, the ultimate disordered love is if you love anything more than God, you ruin it and you ruin yourself. If I love my wife more than I love God, then I crush her with my expectations. If I don't love God more than I love my wife, I will not love her well. There'll be bitterness, there'll be jealousy, there'll be anger, there'll be pressure. In other words, all sins come from that. And if somebody says, I thought the Bible says, I th- I've heard Christians say, sin is disobeying the law of God. Yeah, because Jesus says all the law of God can be summarized in two. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And therefore, what is wrong with us? It's really rather, relatively simple. Our loves are out of order. And our loves are out, out of order because we don't love God supremely. We were built for that. Our hearts are like dislocated bones. And only if our hearts find that resting place, the bu- gets back in the socket, will do things start to order themselves. Now, here's the, what happens. If that's true, uh, three things happen. In other words, we learn three things about, about this. This is what's wrong with us, which is what the Bible calls sin. And three things, if this is true, there's three results. Injustice to you, injustice to yourself, Injustice to others and injustice to God. Very briefly, injustice to yourself. If you love anything more than God, it'll ruin you. And anything else you love, especially the things you love more than God, which is almost everything in most cases, uh, can't help but uh, look at this very famous quote by David Foster Wallace, who was a uh, you know, very famous uh, postmodern poet uh, and, uh, and writer, author, novelist, And at one place in his very famous, uh, uh, it was a commencement speech at Kenyon College, he says this. He says, in the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, be it Yahweh or something like that, is that anything else you worship will not, will eat you alive. Anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they're where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power, you will end up feeling weak and afraid and you will never You will always need more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart. You will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out, Oxford. I mean, he didn't say that. (laughs) But the insidious thing about these forms of worship is their unconscious, their default settings. I mean, I I don't know if he was channeling Augustine there. I don't even know if he ever read Augustine there, but he couldn't have said it any better for a modern audience. So if you love anything more than God, you're doing an injustice to yourself. But secondly, if you love anything more than God, you do an injustice to God. If he exists, think of the injustice. Somebody told me this to illustrate this. I'll give it to you. Imagine a woman, single mother, very little in the way of uh, financial resources, but she has an only son. She loves the son, 
and she works day and night all of her life just to give him the best education, the best life. Eventually he goes to the best university. And as she goes to the university, he, she says, son, I want you to, of course, have a good career and, 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 and become a learned person, but what most of all I, I care about is that you be a good person. I want you to always work hard, always tell the truth, and help the poor. Okay. So, integrity, industry, integrity, generosity. I want you to be a person like that. So he goes to school, and he gets his degree, and he goes off into a great career, and he never talks to his mother after that. Oh, maybe he sends her a card at Christmas and Easter, but he doesn't talk to her, he doesn't call her, he doesn't have a relationship, and if somebody says, what are you doing? He says, well, it, 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 I'm being the person she wanted me to be. That's what really matters, right? Over the years, I've had so many people say, well, I don't know whether I believe in God or not, but what really matters is I'm a good person. No, that's not enough. Not at all. Any more than that, that man is right to say, well, I'm the person she wanted me to be. No, you owe everything to her. You owe everything to him. And to not be living for him is just an injustice. Lastly, and we've got to get to wind this up here, uh, when Jesus says, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as himself, they're clearly linked. As we've seen, only when your ultimate source of love and significance is God, are you not going to be trying to steal it from other people? Simone Weil, the French philosopher, said, all sins are efforts to fill voids. All sins are efforts to fill voids. You are going to trample on other people. You are going to treat people unjustly if you're empty. So lastly, what can be done about it? When Jesus says, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it goes by awfully quickly. When he says, thus Jesus declared all foods clean. Thus Jesus declared all foods clean. He, uh, that goes by awfully fast, but in light of the rest of the whole New Testament, it's very significant. Notice he didn't say, it, didn't, it doesn't read, Jesus said all foods are unclean, or all foods are clean. It doesn't say he said it. If he had said, I say unto you all foods are clean, then he might have been meaning, you know, all that mosaic stuff, the tabernacle, the clean laws, the sacrifices, the blood, and all that, that, that you know, lighten up. We don't need to do that. He doesn't say that there was something wrong with it. He says that as of now, I declare that these things are obsolete. In light of the rest of the New Testament, I can tell you what he's saying. He's saying the clean laws, the sacrifices, all of those parts of the Israelite worship were shadows pointing a real to a reality that I bring. And what is that reality? You're stained. You feel like there's something wrong with you. Jesus says, I can make you clean. Uh, when Nietzsche pointed out that in German, that's not true in English, you know, the word debt and the word guilt are two different words. But in German, the word debt and the word guilt are the same word, schuld. And Nietzsche was trying to make the point that guilt always is a sense of debt. We owe somebody. And he felt like when you get rid of God, that sense of debt would go away. Well, it hasn't, as we try to say. And you know what we owe? We sense that because we're not what we ought to be, that we sense we deserve shame. Kathy and I had a Christian teacher, Elizabeth Elliot, that once said, look at a clam. You see that clam? That clam is glorifying God better than you. You know why? The clam is being exactly what God made the clam to be, a clam. <laughs> but you are not being anything like the man or woman that God meant you to be, and you know it. And you see, the reason why we feel stained is because we feel we deserve shame. But what happened when Jesus Christ came to earth, there's a hymn that goes, bearing shame and scoffing rude, in our place condemned he stood, bearing shame. You know, they didn't just kill him. They mocked him. And they crucified him, which was to strip every bit of dignity away from him. And he took it. Why? Kathy and I, one of our favorite movies is the 1938 movie, Jimmy Cagney and Pat O'Brien, Angels with Dirty Faces. And it's a story about the west side of Manhattan back in the 30s, which was called Hell's Kitchen. And it was a slum at the time, and there were all these street kids out there, gangs. And there's two kids that were friends that grew up differently. One was Rocky Sullivan, grew up to be a gangster, 
uh, and he was a hero to all the other kids on the street, and he killed people. If they, if they didn't respect him, he just killed them. The other guy, Jerry Connolly, Pat O'Brien, uh, grew up to be a priest who worked with at-risk kids. And then Rocky gets caught at the end of the movie, and he's, uh, uh, you know, he's a criminal, he's a gangster, he gets caught, and he's on death row, which meant he was going to go to the electric chair. The night before he's going to go to the electric chair, Pat O'Brien, Jerry Connolly, father Jerry comes and says, I got a request. Rocky says, what is it? He says, tomorrow when you go to the chair, I want you to start screaming. I want you to start crying. I want you to start crying out for mercy. I want you to say, I, I'm scared. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. <laughs> Rocky looks at him and says, what are you talking about? You want me to die without courage? And Jerry says, no, no, no. Oh, no. He says, I'm talking about a courage that only you and I and God will see. Because he says, Rocky, you're the, you're the hero of these kids. If you die in glory, they're going to live lives of shame. They're going to go right where you are. They're going to end up on death row, many of them. Only if they think you're dying a coward, only if you clothe yourself in shame, will they be disillusioned and they'll follow the right path. Hold on to your glory and honor. They live a life of shame. If they're going to have a life of honor, you've got to clothe yourself in shame. And of course, Rocky says, not on your life. You're taking the, the last thing I've got left. But as you might guess, since it's a 1938 Hollywood movie, at the very end, as you just see the shadows of them taking him to the electric chair, suddenly at the very end, he starts crying out, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. And of course, Pat O'Brien looks to heaven and tears. And you know, even you ironic Oxford grads, undergrads, I dare you to watch that and not have it catch your breath, uh, have you catch your breath. But he's, you know, he's, only, and he's only doing what Jesus Christ did. Philippians 2 said, he stripped himself of his honor. He made himself of no reputation. He took on shame so we could have the honor that would last forever. Now that's a long way from explaining how that it becomes an identity you can live into, and we'll talk about that later if you're able to get back here. But here's what I want you to know. Do you feel like you're not what you ought to be? Do you feel in any way stained, Lady Macbeth? Do you feel that damn spot just won't come out? Jesus can get the stain out. Let's get, let's go straight into the questions. So, Tim, the first one we have uh, is this. It seems like a lot of the Christians I know still feel guilt and shame. If what you're saying is true, why is that? Well, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to keep running this joke too long, but I, I did say that Wednesday night we'd talk more about, li I, I, I hinted that Christianity is an identity that needs to be lived into. Uh, so there are plenty of people who right off the bat r immediately uh, for, for some things they've done wrong can get a sense of, uh, uh, certainly get a sense of that, that that particular guilt is taken off of them. But when it comes to uh, the, the deep, the, the, the voice I talked about that calls you a fool, that you're not living up, you're not doing it right, that voice, you could call it conscience, but I think that's probably stronger than that. Uh, something else is going on there. It's a sense, we, we, Christians would say it's a sense of uh, that you know you're alienated from the person God meant you to be. What, whatever you believe, whether you're an atheist, we would believe that you have that sense. Romans chapter 1 talks about that. That is a harder thing to get over, and I, think, I do think it takes a, a pretty good amount of time. Uh, I, and I also think that you, we live in a, especially in a place like Oxford, I don't know if any of you have seen, what is the TV show, Dear the Good Place? Have you seen that at all? It, it, it's a joke about people, no, nobody in America, no, well, nobody in, in, on earth is getting to heaven anymore because there's so many things you can do wrong. If you eat the tomato uh, and uh, you don't really do the research, you might be harming people who uh, are uh, using pesticides in some part of the world. Uh, there's, there's also a, um, a, one of our favorite um, jokes is it said, there, well, you wouldn't even know this unless you're from the United States. There's a great chicken sandwich that if you eat it, it means you hate gay people. You probably haven't heard about that. Uh, that's that's Chick-fil-A, and there's a cons it's conservative, a conservative uh, uh, chain, and of course, they, they ma many people in the gay and lesbian community would say you can't go and eat there. Uh, it's, it, what's happening is more and more, 
you live in a world in which it feels like everything you do seems unjust. It might, you might be involved with hate. Uh, you, you certainly aren't living up to your own uh, standards. And therefore, the, the malaise of guilt and shame is actually stronger, I think, in the world than it was 40 years ago when I still remember being an adult, unlike many of you. Uh, which means, I think, that Christians probably need a lot more. Uh, Christians, in a sense, have money in the bank, emotional money. They've got theological money, you could call it. They've got spiritual money for dealing with that sense of shame and guilt that they, ha they don't know how to draw on it. That's all. So there's, there's, a, there's usually an instant relief, but I totally agree with you to say that Christians themselves are not drawing on the resources, uh, but, but they're there. Mm -hmm. And I, I can just say from 45 years of ministry, I have seen people draw on it, and, and, it, and it does feel to me like unique. I don't, uh, but I'll be talking a little bit more about that on Wednesday. Great. Um, so the next question, if God loved us, why did he give us the ability to love disorderly? Dis oh, well, uh, if, you, if you ask, you're actually asking a question which I, d I don't think it's wrong for Christians to say, I don't know. Uh, the, the traditional idea is that because God made us human beings in his image, meaning we're rational and we have free will, uh, of course, then the possibility of disordered love is is a reality. Uh, certainly, the whatever else you believe about the story of gar the Garden of Eden, uh, when God said, "Don't eat that tree," and He didn't give people a a good reason. I mean, <laughs> had He said in the story, had He said to Adam and Eve, "Don't eat that tree," and if you do, let me show you a little, you know, twenty-minute documentary of what's going to happen. Uh, uh, he didn't do that. Instead, he said, just don't eat that tree, which was another way of saying, don't eat that tree just because you love me. Uh, not because it benefits you or because you, no, just, just do it because you love me. So the story is trying to say, love me, and, uh, and the world will be the way it ought to be. Don't love me, and the world will not. That's what that story means. Uh, why did he even give us the ability to do that? Uh, there is a mystery there. Uh, free will when I was younger, I used to think that the free will uh, answer was enough to say, well, of course, we're not robots, we're not animals, we have free will, so uh, of course we have free will, which means the possibility of, uh, of sin and disordered love. I have to say over the years, I, that's probably not good enough for me altogether. I still think there's some mystery there. Why, if God knew the suffering that would come from it, why did he allow it? But I, I'm here just to try to be candid with you and not feel like I've... Uh, you, you do not, in order to be a Christian, a really thoughtful, assured Christian, you do not have to have the answers to all those things. I could arguably say, I could argue, I will, that uh, if you believe there is no God and we're just a product of evolution only, and yet there's such a thing as human rights and all human beings are equal, uh, that's also an enormous leap of faith. And by the way, an enormous mystery. Why would that be true? How could it be true? I mean, every whatever your... Every, anything from Hinduism to secularism to Christianity, you're going to have some places in your, your belief system, can, some questions your belief system can't account for. So you can't just say, well, because I don't have a good answer to that, therefore, why should I be a Christian? But it's a great question, and I don't have a full answer to it, other than the fact that uh, loving God is what we're made for, and therefore it does seem, in the end, that if, is, you can't love someone unless it's a free choice, and that's the reason why there's a possibility of disordered love. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Uh, I suppose you, you mentioned the Garden of Eden. Um, I did. And, uh, Should I not have? Well, ma maybe that was a mistake. We'll see. Um, <laughs> but you say... Uh, Thank you. Um, well, I'll just read the question. Um, <laughs> you talk about the evil from us, but don't Christians believe in the devil? Where does he come from? What's the explanation for his evil? Well, that's, the same, that, that's a great question, but it's the same. There's a sense in which the devil... The de the devil must have had a Garden of Eden of some kind. You go back further, because obviously there you have a, uh, a sentient being. Uh, we know, you know, we hardly understand ourselves, let alone understanding angels and demons and things like that, but it, evidently there, was somebody, there, there were some others that were made in the image of God who also, they, they were finite creatures. They're not infinite. They're not God. 
They're not gods, and it was there also. They were made to love God with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind, and they failed as well. So there is a sense in which, I don't know whether I shouldn't say this because somebody's going to tweet this, and then that's the end of my reputation of an orthodox Christian minister. But, but I mean, there must have been something behind the Garden of Eden where something already happened. Um, so w- when somebody says, where did evil come from? I, I had a professor once that said, uh, it, it actually probably came from somewhere before the Garden of Eden, which would have meant something that happened in the life of, that produced Satan. And so, uh, yeah, so Satan comes before, but it's the same basic idea. Human be- pardon me, I shouldn't say human beings this way. Beings made in the image of God who are built to love because our God is a triune God. The Christian God is not a unipersonal God who would not have had love as something that didn't come into God's life until God created another person. We believe in a tri-personal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from all eternity, which means the Christian God really can say love is intrinsic to who God is, not something that comes in later. And therefore, to be made in the image of God is to... Uh, is to step into that incredible joy and glory uh, that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit already have in loving one another with their entire beings. So it wasn't just human beings. Evidently, there are other beings. For all I know, there may be other beings besides that we don't know about. But anything anyone made in God's image was made for love. And not to be loved God supremely is to basically put yourself on a road toward darkness and hell. And so, yes, it started before the Garden of Eden. So, um, staying on the question of loving God and um, if that's what we're made for. So, if our problem, um, the que- this question is, our problem you're saying is that we don't love God enough. Um, but can you love God and not be a Christian? Oh, yes. Uh, I actually would say that there's, a, I've been here to try to say there's unequaled resources for that, though. I mean, I... Um, I mean, I'd better speak personally here because that's actually a tough question. If I try to love God in the abstract, I say, well, God made me and he's keeping me alive every minute. That gives me a sense of gratitude. I mean, how would I develop love for God? Not just belief in God. So I'm glad we're talking about this because it's not believing in God that, that in a sense heals your heart of what's wrong with it. It's love of God. That's the St. Augustine, absolutely right. I can believe in God and then go out and be very unjust. If I loved God perfectly, I would never do an act of injustice. That's, Augustine makes a great case for that, and I think he's right. So if that's the case, then, how do I... I can't just say, oh, I should love God. I have to... It, I'm a whole person. I can't just say it to myself. I've got I've to feel it, okay? Presbyterian actually said, I've got to feel it. It's amazing. Uh, how do you do that? You can, you can get grateful to your, you think about gratitude, think about God gave you everything. But when I think about God coming to earth, emptying himself of his glory, being born in a manger, uh, bearing shame and scoffing rude, going to the cross, almost every night I'll be talking about this, uh, I believe that gets, that gets me to a very new level of love. When I see sacrifice, uh, I, one time I said, a woman did come to me and actually asked me this question, and I must have been in a bad mood, I'm sorry, uh, for even telling you this, because it was, I, I was younger, I was less mellow, uh, and they came and said, I believe, I love God, and I, I believe I can love God without being a Christian, and maybe I was, like I said, I should have said, I said, let me ask you a question, what has your God sacrificed in order to love you? What has your God given up? What has he sacrificed in order to love you? And she said, nothing. I said, well, um, it's when I see someone sacrifice for me that it, it, it pulls me out, my heart out toward them. And as far as I know, Christianity is the only God that's got a God that does that. So uh, she, by the way, wasn't offended. She said I hadn't thought about that, so I probably was, I probably was smiling when I said it. So I'm saying it to you like this. Mm. Uh, we've probably got time for one more question. Okay. I'd say I'm just trying to choose this, which I think is... Make it uh, really hard, Johnny. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Ratchet it up. Well, th- th- this is on a similar theme to what you were just saying. Okay. Um, uh, and perhaps you could, yeah, uh, uh, unpack it perhaps in a, d- a, a different way. So uh, this person says, I didn't understand why it wouldn't be enough just to love each other rather than love God. Could you explain that in a different way? Right. Uh, 
I tried to speak to that. I probably only gave it 90 seconds. I gave an illustration. Uh, there was some years ago, somebody did come to me and say, I love other people. Why do I need to love God? And the argument I tried to give you in that, uh, whoever asked the question, the story, you probably remember the story, but I probably did not, my wife often says, I didn't ring the changes. I didn't, I let it go by too quickly. The story of the woman who gives everything to get her son uh, a, a good education and a good career. And then the son ethically does the things the mother wants, but has no relationship. Uh, I was trying to say, if there is a God who made you, created you, keeps you alive every second, and of course, in, in the Christian case, came to earth and, and sacrificed in order to uh, deal with your debt, deal with your shame, and so on. If there is a God like that, then to not love him is an injustice. It's a terrible injustice. It would be it'd be far more uh, a greater injustice than if th that young man acting like that to his mother, I don't know if there's anybody anywhere that would think that what he was doing was, uh, was just. That's an injustice. Because he's saying, hey, I'm good to the poor, I'm good to everybody else, I'm honest, I'm working hard. So you might say, horizontally to everybody else, I'm loving other people. No, I don't love my mother, but I'm, I'm being the person that you want. And I'm saying, if there is a God, then it is not enough just to love other people. And uh, I tried to say, if, well, listen, my wife, my wife who's sitting, the reason I keep saying this is my wife, my wife Kathy's over here. If Kathy and I only try to love each other without loving God more, and it's a struggle to love God more than your spouse, particularly if you have a, a good marriage, uh, there's absolutely no way we would be doing it well. We would, we would be putting too much pressure on each other. Uh, we would be getting too disappointed if the, each of us would feel like, well, the other person's having a problem, we'd melt down because the other person's almost like your God because it's the main, you, that person's the main source of, of, of affirmation for you. There's all kinds of ways in which simply loving other people simply is not enough. Not only that, you won't love other people well unless you love God. So from the justice point of view, you need to love God, not just other people. And from the practical point of view, you need to love God or you won't really be able to love other people in the same way. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Tim. That's all the uh, time we have for, for questions. Shall we give Tim a round of applause? Uh, thank you so much.